Kamo, what's going on? The Guasha asked in the Banyue language as she landed. The moment she spoke, Shirlian thought that her voice was very different from what he had imagined. Although still cold, her voice was tiny, like the grumblings of a sulky child, not a voice that was cool and powerful. If not for his good hearing, he might not even have heard her properly. What's going on? They're all dead, Kumo shouted. How did they die? The Gosha asked. Isn't it because you pushed them all down and trapped them in this godforsaken hell? Who's here? There's another person, the Gosha said. At the bottom of the pit should be two other people, but Sun Lang had neither breath nor heartbeat, so the Gosha didn't detect his presence. It was also complete chaos on top of the walls earlier, and no one kept track of who fell and who ran away, so she thought that there was only Shirlian. It was them who killed all of my soldiers. Are you happy now? Everyone you wanted to kill is finally dead, Kamo said. The Gosha was silent, and suddenly a tiny burst of light flared, illuminating a small, black-clad girl with a palm torch. The girl looked to be 15 or 16, both eyes blackened, not unbeautiful, but just unhappy. Her forehead and cheeks were full of bruises, clear and distinct under the light. The hand controlling the palm torch was shaking, causing the flames to flicker. If it hadn't been confirmed earlier, no one would think that this pale little girl was the Gorsha of Banyue. The flames in her hand illuminated herself and her surroundings. The ground next to her feet was piled with the armoured corpses of Banyue soldiers. Shirlian couldn't help but sneak a look beside himself. The palm torch in the Gorsha's hand was very small and did not light up the entire pit, so they were still immersed in darkness. But using the little bit of light, Shirlian could still faintly see that the one next to him was dressed in red. It wasn't clear and he wasn't sure, but he could still somewhat distinguish what was close to him. Sun Lang was already taller than him, but now, maybe, he seemed taller than before. Shirlian moved his eyes up, paused at the neck, then continued upward, stopping at an elegantly shaped chin. Sun Lang's upper features were still hidden in the shadows, but Shirlian thought that the bottom half was distinctly different than before. Still handsome, but the lines were much more defined. Feeling that he was being watched, Sun Lang tilted his head and his lips curled upward slightly. Perhaps he wanted too much to get a better look, that without realizing it, Shirlian took a step closer to Sun Lang. Just then, Kamo wailed in the distance, seeming to be in shock after seeing the bloody tragedy before him. Shirlian abruptly snapped out of it and turned to look and saw that Kamo was clutching his own head, but despite the general's cries, the Gorsha's expression remained wooden, and she only nodded. Good, she said. In the midst of mourning, hearing that word made Kamo rage once more. Good, he shouted. What's good? What do you mean? Good means that we're finally free, the Gorsha said. She turned to Shirlian who was still shrouded in the dark. Were you the one who killed them? This was an accident, Shirlian replied. You're lying through your teeth, Kamo exclaimed. Shirlian responded bold-facedly. Life is full of accidents. The Gorsha gave him a look, but her expression was unreadable. Who are you? Her words were spoken in perfect Han dialect, and it wasn't said in an interrogative tone. I'm a heavenly official. This one here is my friend, Shirlian replied. Kamo couldn't understand their words, 
but could still tell that they weren't fighting, and demanded, What are you two saying? The Gorsha looked Shirlian over and eyed Sanlang for a moment, before quickly looking away. She said, We've never had heavenly officials visit before. I thought that you had all already abandoned this place. Shirlian had thought that they would have to fight the Gorsha of Banyue, but was surprised to find that she was this despondent, devoid of any will to fight. She spoke up again. Do you two want to leave? Of course we do, but there's an array set in this pit, so we can't, Shirlian said. Hearing this, the Gorsha walked to one of the walls, raised her hand, and drew something. She turned around and said, There, I've released the array. You two can leave now. This was too easy. Shirlian really didn't know what to say now. Just then, a voice called from above. Hey, is anyone down there? If not, I'm leaving. It was Fu Yao's voice. Shirlian heard Sun Lang tisk next to him and immediately looked up. There was a shadow of a man looking down into the pit. Shirlian shouted, Fu Yao, there's people down here. I'm down here. After Shirlian shouted, he also waved and Fu Yao shouted back from above, You're actually down there? What's at the bottom besides you? Um, a lot of things. Why don't you come down and see for yourself, Shirlian said. Fu Yao probably thought the same and blew a large ball of fire into the pit. In an instant, the entire sinner's pit was lit up, bright like day, and Shirlian finally saw clearly the kind of place that he'd been standing in. All around him were mountains of bloody corpses, piled high, innumerable bodies of Banyue soldiers stacked on top of each other, faces and limbs blackened, dark blood smearing the bright armour. The corner that Shirlian was standing in was the only spot in the entire Sinus Pit that did not have a dead body. This was all done in a flash, in the dark, by Sun Lung after he jumped in. Shirlian turned to look at the boy next to him again. Before, in the dark, he thought Sun Lung looked taller and was distinctly different in certain features. But now, under the bright firelight, the one standing next to him was the same handsome youth that he'd known. When he saw that Shirlian looked over, he grinned. Shirlian looked down to check his wrists and boots, and both were also the same as before, having nothing that would cause any jingling sound. Just then, Shirlian heard a muffled noise. It was the sound of Fu Yao jumping down. Weren't you looking after the merchants? Shirlian asked. Having just entered the pit, Fu Yao wasn't yet used to the stench of blood, and fanned his hand to make the air flow. He replied indifferently. We waited for over six hours and there was still no sign of you, so we figured that something had happened. I drew a circle for them to wait in and came to check things out for myself. Shirlian frowned. The circle won't last long. With you gone, what if they leave the circle thinking that you'd left them behind? Fuyao shrugged. Eight horses can't stop a man who really wants to seek death. I can't stop stubborn people, so nothing. What's with those two over there? Who is whom? Fu Yao was tense, ready to defend against the two unknown people, but soon discovered, astonishingly, that Ker Mo was already heavily wounded on the ground, barely able to stand, and that the Gorsha of Banyue had her head lowered and was silent. That one is the general of Banyue, and the other one is the Gorsha of Banyue. Right now, there, Kamor suddenly leapt up before Shirlian could finish. He had been lying on the ground, gathering his strength, and was finally able to jump up with a shout, aiming his fists at the Gorsha of Banyue. A large, beefy warrior 
attacking a little girl. In the past, Shurian would have never allowed the sort of thing to happen in front of him. But Kermor had every reason to hate the Gorsha, and she could very well defend herself. Yet she didn't. She let herself be thrown around like a broken rag doll. Kermor shouted at the Gorsha, Where are your scorpion snakes? Come on, let them bite me to death too. Give me that release. The Gorsha gloomily replied, Kermor, my snakes don't listen to me anymore. Then why don't they kill you? He scoffed. I'm sorry, Kermor, the Gorsha apologized softly. Do you really hate us that much? Kermor shouted. The Gorsha shook her head and Kermor became angrier. You're going to be the death of me. If you don't hate us, then why did you betray us? You shameless spy, disgusting mole, you traitor. Fu Yao watched him strike harder and harder. The blows were all single-sided and he couldn't help but frown. What are they saying? Shouldn't we go and stop them? Shirlian couldn't watch any more either and rushed forward to stop Kermor. General, General, why don't you tell us who that young Anthag really is? We'll... Suddenly, the Gorsha grabbed Shirlian's wrist. The grip was hard and came unexpectedly, and Shirlian's heart dropped, thinking that she was going to ambush him. But when he looked back down at her, the Gorsha was on the ground, a small bruise at the corner of her mouth, her head raised, watching him intently. She didn't say a single word, but her dark eyes were intense with the flaming sense of life. This demeanor overlapped with an image from a far-gone memory. After a pause, Shirlian blurted, It's you? The Gorsha's voice also trembled. General Hua? This back and forth stunned everyone in the pit. Fu Yao rushed forward, knocked Kermo out with a punch, and demanded, You two know each other? Shirlian didn't answer him. He knelt down, gripped the soldiers of the Gorsha, and examined her face. Earlier, they had stood too far apart, and he couldn't see clearly. Plus, it had been over 200 years. This girl had matured in that time, and for many various reasons, he didn't recognize her at first. But now that he looked again properly, it was the same face from his memory. Shirlian couldn't speak for the longest time, and it was a good moment before he sighed. Banyue? The Gorsha quickly clutched at his sleeves, and the gloomy face suddenly came alive with excitement. It's me, General Hua. Do you remember me? Of course I remember you, but... Shirlian gazed at her for a moment and sighed. But what have you done to yourself? Hearing his words, her eyes suddenly filled with pain. I'm sorry, Captain. I messed up, she muttered. In that exchange, there was General This and Captain That, making it glaringly obvious to the bystanders. Fu Yao was in shock. Captain? General? You? How did this happen? Then the tomb of the general, he pushed. It's my tomb, Shirlian replied. Didn't you say that you only came to collect junk 200 years ago? Fu Yao questioned. This is a long story. That was originally the plan, Shirlian answered. Around 200 years ago, due to some such reasons, Shirlian couldn't map around in the east anymore and decided to stay out of sight for a while. He had planned to cross the Qing Ridge and head to the south to start a brand new life of collecting scraps. Thus, he took up his compass and walked southward. But the more he walked, the more he thought woefully. How come the scenery was all wrong? It should have been an abundance of trees and greenery, cities and crowds. So how come this path was becoming more desolate. Suspicion aside, however, Shirlian stubbornly continued on. He walked and walked and came upon the Gobi Desert. 
It took a gust of wind blowing a fistful of sand into his face before Shirlian finally realized that his compass was broken. The direction it was guiding him in, this entire journey, was wrong. Since there wasn't anything that he could do about this whole thing, he might as well take this chance to visit the desert scenery and continued walking. Only, he changed course slightly and travelled northwestward and finally arrived at the border where he settled nearby to the kingdom of Banyue. At first, I was just collecting junk around the area, Shirlian said, but the border was troubled and with so many skirmishes, there were often runaway soldiers, so the army would draft anyone into recruit to make up the numbers. So you were forced into the army? Sun Lung asked. Yeah, Shirlin replied, but doing anything at all was more or less the same, so it didn't matter to me. And then, after chasing away some bandits a couple of times, I somehow got promoted to captain. The people gave me face and would call me General too. Then why did she call you General Hua? Fu Yao questioned. Your surname isn't Hua. Shirlin waved his hand and said dismissively, Don't worry about it. I randomly made up a fake name at the time. I think it was Hua Xie. Hearing the name, Sun Lang's expression changed slightly, his lips twitching. Shirlin didn't pay attention and continued. With the battle-torn border came many orphans. When I was free, I'd play with them sometimes. One of them was named Banyue. When there were bandits, Shirlin was surely the bravest soldier, and no one dared block his way, nor did anyone dare to even stand beside him. But when there weren't, it was as if anyone could order him around. One day, he went and sat by a wall to start a campfire using his own helmet to cook. As he cooked, the smell of it drifted out, and a few enraged soldiers came to kick over whatever it was that he was cooking. Shirlin picked up his helmet with a broken heart, but when he looked back, he saw a small, disheveled, and grimy child crouched behind him, picking at the stuff that had been knocked to the ground with her hands, without caring whether it was too hot, and stuffing it, into her mouth. Shirlin was shocked. Don't. Wait, little kid. You... As expected, the little kid scarfed down a few lumps of the stuff she had picked off the ground, then dry heaved heavily, crying loudly. Shirlin was so shaken that he picked her up upside down and ran laps until all the stuff she ate came back out. After that was done, he crouched down and wiped away a seat for them. Are you alright, little kid? I'm so sorry, but don't ever tell your parents about this. And next time, don't pick up any more random stuff off the ground to eat. Wait, what are you doing now? That child's face was covered in tears, but she still went to pick off the ground again, still wanting to eat. It was only after Shirlian grabbed her that he realized that the skin of this child's stomach was practically pressed to the back of her bones. When people starved to this point, anything could be eaten. Even if it was disgusting to the point of tears, she would still eat it. Shirlian had no choice and went back to bring her the last of his rations. Then afterward, he could often see this child stalking him in the shadows nearby. In his memories, the little girl Banyue was always gloomy, her body and face full of bruises. And when she looked at him, she would stare just so from below. Because she was singled out by the children of the Banyue kingdom, other than Shirlian, there was only a young unboy living at the border who would sometimes pay attention to her. So she'd spend her days tagging along behind the two of them. She rarely spoke, but she was fluent in the Hun dialect, so Shirlian didn't know where she came from. But she was a random wandering child, so he randomly took her in. When he was free, sometimes he'd teach them songs, sometimes he'd wrestle, sometimes he'd show off 
his move from when he used to busk, shattering boulders on one's chest, and they got along quite well. Shirlian shook his head. I had thought that the Baniwe in the Gorsha's title was the name of the country. I didn't realize it was actually the name of the Gorsha. And then, Freya asked, and then it's pretty much the same as what the memorial wrote, Shirlian said. After some silence, Zan Lang spoke up. The memorial said that you died. On the subject of that memorial, Shirlian felt quite bummed out. Weren't memorials usually praise and exaggerated good deeds to glorify the deceased? All those mentions of the demotions aside, why did it have to so solemnly record the embarrassing way that he died? While they were hiding away from the sandstorm, when he read to the spot, he could barely look at it straight on. If it wasn't for San Lang, who also understood Banyue's script and was watching him, he was going to pretend that that segment never existed. Having something like that written down, even he wanted to laugh at it, never mind other people. That he'd had the nerve to ask those seeking shelter in his memorial to not laugh as they commented and laughed aloud at his epitaph. It made him feel really sad. Shirlian's forehead was becoming red from all the rubbing. Oh that, um, of course I didn't die. I faked it. Fu Yao had a face full of disbelief, so Shirlian explained himself. I got trampled on too hard and couldn't get up, so there wasn't any other way besides faking my death anyway. Truthfully, Shirlian couldn't quite remember how he died or why that battle broke out in the first place, only that it was over something petty. He really didn't want to fight, Victory or defeat was meaningless to him. But by then, his rank could go no lower, and no one would listen to him. In the midst of battle, everyone saw red. So when he rushed out, it was all blades and swords coming at him, from both sides, cutting him down. Fu Yao questioned, It must be because you're an eyesore, standing in the middle, that you raise the ire of both sides, right? Otherwise, why would people just cut you down when they saw you? Besides, I'm sure you knew that there were many who hated you. So why didn't you evade all of those people? Why did you have to charge in? I'm sure you could have dodged if you wanted to. Mm-hmm.